Hey lads, how's it going? Happy birthday, Adrian. Thank you, Enda. Uh, Michelin, we would have thought that this would have been a pretty sticky tie for Celtic anyway. So how badly are people taking this? <laughs> how badly are people taking it? Um, people are already, you know, crossing off this season as a failure already on. So it um, it wasn't a good good result for Celtic. I think, look, a lot of people thought going into this game it was going to lead to a defeat anyway. So that, so, that sort of softens the blow a little bit. But again, if you're looking at a team like Michelin, who have only been ex in existence since 1999, a team like Celtic should be beating them. A team like Celtic should be beating... Uh, the a, a Danish side to get into the third round qualifiers of the Champions League. So ultimately disappointing, not surprising, uh, giving the build up to the game, giving the preparations. Is it more to do with the fact that this is just, what is it, the fourth consecutive year that they haven't made the Champions League group stage? Is it, is it more the accumulation of things or, or are, are people genuinely getting wound up with the fact that this is a, a club that's 21 years or 22 years of age? Like, should, does, does that really matter? Like, this is the club that's actually made quite big strides over the last little while and Celtic obviously have had a bad season last year. Yeah, well, it, it is an accumulation. It's the accumulation over the a number of years now. And if you look at this team, look of, of FC Michelin and the tie in general, they're the antithesis of, of what Celtic are, are trying to do. Like, they are, they are a well-organized club who have sorted out their, sc their scouting They've got a good owner in place that is progressive and knows what the modern what it takes to succeed in the modern game. And then Celtic have Dermot Desmond in charge, who you know, the they were supposed to start this rebuild as of last year. So far, they have a manager, and um, they've they've lost their uh, chief scout, they've lost their uh, CEO, they've got a new CEO coming in. So the rebuild has not even gotten off the ground yet. So it, it's a long way coming. Celtic, you know, if you look at the last four years, so it's four years since Celtic uh, have, have gotten to the Champions League. And over the last five years, since 2015, Celtic have gotten beat in the Champions League qualifiers by Malmo, by AAK Athens, by Cluj, by Frank Barros, and now by mm. Michelin. So they are sides you would expect a club like Celtic to beat. Uh, they're sides that you would expect Celtic to get through pretty handily, and they were well beaten by pretty much all those sides. So the, the problem is the preparation going into this game. So obviously Celtic had this horrendous season. Neil Lennon was, uh, I, I want to say, sacked, but he wasn't even sacked. He stepped down in February. Celtic wasted four months chasing Eddie Howe only to be let down. They have only had one player that they've brought into the club that was registered for this game, despite knowing this game was happening back way at the start of last season. So they were incredibly unprepared going into this game. New manager coming in five weeks before a Champions League qualifier is just not uh, where Celtic want to be as a club. So, listen, sorry, just in terms of, sorry, just one more. It, like right. it, in, in terms of the specifics of last night then, is there any particular individual? Are you looking at the sideline or, or where is most of your anger or your disappointment going? No, I definitely wouldn't blame it on on Ange Postacoglu, the new manager. If anything, I give him huge credit because, <laughs> I mean, if you look at the size last night, Celtic go into that game. If you look at the back four in its infancy, it's basically the, you've got Anthony Ralston, who's 22 years old. He's played two games over the last two years. We'll get we'll get back to him and the reason he's playing. Stephen Welsh, 21 years old, broke into the side last year. Dean Murray playing centre half, 18 years old. This was only one of his fir first senior games. He, he came on against Michelin last week when Nir Beaton got sent off. And then Greg Taylor, who was the replacement for Kieran Tierney's replacement, volleyball and goalie, who obviously has no future at the club given what happened last year. So to get even to this stage where Celtic were competitive in this game, competitive in the leg, and led the leg twice, um, led in the first leg, led in the second leg, only conceded three shots against Michelin, three of those ended up being goals. The job that Pasta has done in five weeks to transform this club into a competitive team has actually been quite impressive. Where the blame would fall is the lack of urgency within the board. Like I said, Neil Lennon stepped down in February. They chased Eddie Howe for four months and were let down. Then they got Ange Postacoglu in. Recruitment-wise, like I said, Anthony Ralston playing right back, he was never going to be good enough for the club. He wasn't good enough under three previous regimes. He's not going to be good enough now. Celtic sold their leading right back in January, Jeremy Frimpong, he went to Bayer Leverkusen. They brought in John Joe Kenny on loan. They knew since January they needed a right back. They're only now getting that right back in uh, Aurelio Buta. He's coming in from uh, Royal Antwerp from Belgium. So he's only coming in, coming in now. 
and the rebuild that they were talking about at the start of the season, it was supposed to happen when, you know, the 10 in a row came. It hasn't happened. Dermot Desmond is is still leading things by all accounts. He's still popping his nose in where it's not wanted. Peter Lawwell has left. Uh, Dominic Mackay came in. He's, you know, he's only starting his role, so you give him a bit of credit. But, you know, Celtic were supposed to modernise the club. A director of football was supposed to come in. That didn't happen. A lead scout was supposed to come in. That didn't happen. Ange Postacoglu comes in. He still doesn't have his own proper coaching staff. He's still working with John Kennedy and uh, Strachan, who were Neil Lennon's, not not even Neil Lennon's choice. He, they were Dermot Desmond's choice. So you're, you're talking about this rebuild, and so far the rebuild is Ange Postacoglu. The one person coming in, mm. he is not going to transform Celtic to what they want it to be. I was looking at some of the quotes after the game last night, and I, I haven't done a good enough job of convincing people that we needed to bring people in, which is the thing that you're touching on there. I, I, it struck me as maybe a slightly odd comment, but um, like you mentioned about the issues in defence and the most experienced defender last night being 23 years of age. <laughs> but the excuse me, the result last night possibly uh, is the best thing maybe to happen to Celtic in terms of his ability to convince the owners that this needs to change rapidly in terms of turning the season around. I would love if you were correct. I would love if that was. Uh, I mean, it's not. If, it's not as if Celtic aren't bringing in players, right? So last season they brought in, uh, I think it was six signings. It, it was just that the the signings don't really seem to make sense. And you know, Celtic know they're going to be in this Champions League qualifier. They've been in it for years now. They know they have to get the business done in time for this qualifier. And like I said, uh, Lil Abada, who came in from an Israeli side, he's the only player the Celtic signed this year that was registered in time for this game. They've already made a couple of signings. And, you know, some people might be able to say, they might throw back in your face that, you know, they didn't know who their manager was. They didn't want to bring in players who he didn't want to work with um, when he got there. But that's actually not the case because Celtic are still working off an old scouting list, it seems. So Liam Shaw, who's come in, uh, Ozai Urukide, they both come in from Sheffield Wednesday. They were scouted last year. They were on the old scouting list. So, I mean, if they were coming in anyway, get them in early for this fixture. Lil Abada, like I said, he's on the old scouting list. Why was he not in before this as well? And then there's a couple of players that you can point to. Uh, for Kashi, who's coming in from, he's coming from Asia. He seems to be the only signing that is Ange Postacoglu signing. And I, I mentioned Dermot Desmond sticking his nose in where he's not wanted. A lot of people in the club and a lot of well-sourced people are saying that Dermot Desmond is involved in the day-to-day -day football action that's not how you want your lead shareholder to be acting you want him involved in the business side you don't want him involved involved in the football and if you look at the list of signings that he is um, he's credited with it's not a great list and he's currently being credited with another guy who's, who's uh, supposed to be coming into the the team joe hart joe hart is due to join celtic in the next couple of days and i i, I don't know if you saw my screenshot the way that Ange Postacoglu plays football, the keeper essentially plays as a a, a third defender. You know, he uh, at, at points Scott Bain was playing almost in the center circle of the midfield, working like he gets the ball first and he starts attack. Joe Hart was, you know, I don't know what what Pep, you know, Pep wanted Claudio Bravo, who was dropping balls into the net, and he was still favoring him over Joe Hart because of how bad he was at football. So. If Joe Hart is brought in as the replacement keeper, then that shows you that it's not Ange Postecoglou making the decisions in terms of transfers. It's someone else who doesn't know what they're doing. So that's the issue with recruitment. It's a mixture of uh, is the manager really the one making the decisions here? And it doesn't seem like he is. Very quickly, and uh, suddenly a 25-point gap to Rangers might be an achievement this season from the picture you're painting. Yeah, well, see, here's the thing about Scottish football is that especially in the last couple of years, it can go horribly wrong. You still finish second. So what what Ange Postacoglu needs to do is finish less second than uh, Neil Lennon did last year. He needs to just narrow that gap a little bit. I mean, if you beat Rangers once or twice, then you're, you know, practically potentially on your way to a league title. So it's, it's not a, a disaster just yet. But I think... A lot of Celtic fans will still judge themselves regardless of how often they get to Europe or not in, in modern times as a European team. And Celtic need to start acting like a European team. I've been saying it for years now that, you know, Celtic have built for the domestic success. I think that was Peter Lawwell's legacy is 
he's had so much domestic success but so much failure in Europe and if Celtic built for Europe they would ultimately be successful domestically so I, I, I don't get the idea of putting domestic football first you put European football first if you're a team like Celtic that want to develop um, on the world stage and develop talent that you're going to sell for a lot of money because ultimately these clubs are businesses and if you're playing in Europe, if you're playing consistently in Europe, that's a marketplace for your best players. So uh, it, it's going to ultimately lead to further, um, you know, lack of funds. They're not going to have uh, the same amount of money to challenge in Europe or to challenge for transfers as they, as they did previously. And I mean, it's 40 million euro down the drain now that Celtic don't get because they don't get to the Champions League. So ultimately, it's going to hurt the business. And that's where Celtic will really start to, uh, to start to fall back.